It's clear that by the 22nd of November 1942, the situation for the Axis was almost completely out of hand. Army Group B's command structure was in chaos, and von Weichs' only hope now of stopping the Soviets was the 14th Panzer Corps, which was almost out of fuel. Everything now depended on whether Huber's threadbare Panzer Corps could muster enough skill, strength and determination to thwart what was now recognised by friend and foe alike as a successful deep exploitation operation. Probably knowing that communications were about to be caught, Paulus moved his headquarters to Gumrak after an order from Hitler. Pickert, commander of the 9th Flak Division, also flew to Gumrak to rejoin his division, and Richthofen had placed him in charge of all Luftwaffe operations in the pocket, including the upcoming airlift operation. From the Soviet perspective, Vatutin was extremely pleased by Rokossovsky's advance the day before. Yes, his units were behind schedule, but they were nearly at collage, and it was clear that the forces that Powell had put in front of them were incredibly weak. In fact, the quartermaster at Kalach hadn't even heard that the Soviets were so close, and Colonel Adam had to inform him about what was going on. He then sprang into action to alert the nearby units. And with basically nothing in their way, Vatutin, Yeremenka and Rokossovsky ordered the formations to achieve the main objective of Operation Uranus, the encirclement of German forces, which they would achieve by taking the town of Kalach and linking up with the forces of the other fronts. Under pressure, Lacer's 29th Motorized Division slowly withdrew back to the Shevlinaya River, allowing Tulbukin's 57th Army to strike for its objectives. Unfortunately, due to one of the German fuel dumps falling into Soviet hands, the 129th Panzer Battalion couldn't be used for a planned counterattack because they had to conserve what fuel remained. To me, this is another indication that a breakout attempt would have to be conducted without the use of panzers, at least after the initial stages. Also, the panzer crews were exhausted after three days of combat, with Jason DeMarc recording that they collapsed into a death-like slumber in their billets that evening. So, they were in no position to launch an offensive to the south. At the same time, Shumilov's 64th Army battled with the Romanian 20th and German 297th Infantry Divisions, sending in fresh rifle, tank and artillery forces in order to overcome their defences. The Soviets did advance, although they only did so by leaving their wounded abandoned in the snow because ambulances had to be diverted to resupply operations. Even so, the 157th Rifle Division ran out of meat and bread, and this might explain why the newly committed 36th Guards Rifle Division barely advanced 5 kilometers 3 miles throughout the whole day. Still, this was enough to persuade Yenica to pull the 20th Romanian and 297th Infantry Divisions back to a new line in the north, centred on a formidable natural defensive position along a Balka, a line which would prove difficult to overcome in the future. This new German defensive line occupied part of the old Russian K and S defensive positions that were constructed before the battle for the city of Stalingrad began. 4th Army Corps was also officially transferred to Paulus's command, since it had lost communication with Hoth's army. And with the Axis line now further north, Volsky's 4th Mechanized Corps drove northwestwards, reaching the village of Verkny Zarinchinsky before daybreak. However, at this point, Yeremenka sent Volsky a message ordering him to alter course and head north towards Karpovka. Volsky wasn't sure what to do, since the orders were contrary to the overall plan, and therefore split his forces in two once he reached Bozinovka. His 36th Brigade would continue towards Kalach, while his 59th and 60th Brigades would head to Karpovka. German rear services and security units put up resistance, but couldn't stop the Soviets from crossing the river northwest of Marianovka. And the forces heading towards Karpovka were halted by the regiment-sized campgrupper led by von Hanstein, which stood its ground at the Voroshilov POW camp. At the same time to the south, Yeremenko believed that Shapkin was taking his time, and so he ordered him to accelerate his pace. 
Shapkin's 4th Cavalry Corps therefore drove south against what little Romanian resistance remained, and started to create a new outer encirclement front. Token resistance from Romanian remnants couldn't prevent them from moving on Aksai, and the Soviet 61st Cavalry Division drove the Romanian 8th Cavalry Division back as well. Clearly, the southern flank of the Soviet offensive was doing well. To the west, Rodin's 26th Tank and Kravchenko's 4th Tank Corps also resumed their advance in the morning. And I would just like to apologise, because I got the sequence of events wrong in the last video. Butkov's 1st Tank Corps only reached the Liska River on this day, the 22nd, not on the 21st as shown last video. They were further back than this in the morning, and then raced up to the river at the end of the 22nd. So their current positions are where they were towards the end of this day, and they then took another couple of villages further south. So, sorry about that. Luckily, it doesn't really alter anything significant regarding the battle, because there was no Axis units in the way anyway, but it's frustrating nonetheless. Anyway, to the north of the tanks, Plieve's 3rd Guards Cavalry Corps moved up to secure their flank, and ended up driving the 16th and 24th Panzer Divisions back north, although failed to take out 16th Panzer Division's position at Malo Golubinsky. Still, the fact that these cavalry units had been enough to stop Huber's Panzer Corps from striking south shows just how weak the German units were at this time. Anyway, Filipov left the Ostrov region at 0300 hours, and reached the Don River opposite Kalach at 0600 hours. Unfortunately for the Soviets, the main bridge was destroyed by Colonel Hans Mikosh's engineers. Undeterred, Filipov's men dismounted and continued on foot, reinforced by a company of tanks from Major Makur's 157th Tank Brigade. Filipov's detachment pushed forward, undeterred, until it met a local inhabitant, who informed the commander that the Germans had blown the bridge at Kalach. The local then led the detachment northward three kilometers west-northwest of the center of Kalach. The Don River at this location was 600 meters wide, with a small island in the middle, so there were actually two bridges connecting the island to the two banks of the river. Filipov ordered a tank and some infantry to assault the island. At first, the German sentries, 24 men from Organization Tot, thought that the tank was one of theirs. Now, the sources differ, with some saying that the Germans had used captured T-34s for training purposes in the area, and in fact the Germans were using T-34s to defend Kalach, but when the tank got closer, they realized their mistake and started firing. However, other sources say that the Soviets were actually using two captured German panzers and a reconnaissance vehicle, which might explain why the Germans didn't fire at first. Either way, the sentries were deceived, the bridge was seized, and the Soviets disarmed the demolition charges before the Germans could detonate them. Glantz argues that, had the sentries blown the bridge, it could have caused a delay by one to three days, which may have influenced German decisions regarding a breakout or a break-in at Stalingrad. The problem is that the Germans had nothing to break into Stalingrad with at this time, and arguably Paulus wasn't in a position to break out either, so realistically, whether this bridge was blown or not, it probably wouldn't have changed the outcome of the battle drastically. Meanwhile, the rest of the 26th Tank Corps moved to the Don against light Romanian and German resistance, reaching the river by the end of the day. The 19th Tank Brigade also secured a passage over the river to reinforce Filipov's advanced detachment. In the area southwest of Kalach, the German rear service units used 50 captured Soviet tanks to resist against the 157th Tank Brigade as it attacked towards the town. Major McCurr was killed early in this action, and was replaced by his political officer, although the fighting had also forced Mikosh to fall back south. The 45th Tank Brigade from the 4th Tank Corps also crossed the Don north of Kalach. Zooming out, the good news was that the two Soviet pincers were now just 20 kilometers, 13 miles, from one another. And while they technically hadn't linked up yet, they had already cut the 6th Army's communications with the outside world, and had effectively surrounded the 6th Army. Worse, there was basically nothing between them that could stop them from meeting up, so it was only a matter of time before they did join hands. 
Thus, even though it wasn't over, Operation Uranus had been a success. The Soviets were winning. Further north, Batov's 65th Army launched an attack against Strecker's 11th Army Corps, driving the 376th Infantry Division from Lugovsky. They formed a line nearby, but were forced back from that one as well to a third line. And there was a chance that Galanin's forces could strike south and encircle the German 11th Army Corps in a pocket in the Don Bend. However, as soon as Galanin began his attack, his forces were hit by heavy German artillery, mortar and small arms fire, and as a result they barely went anywhere, saving Strecker from immediate danger. The 55th and 112th Cavalry Divisions continued their fight with the German and Romanian tank forces. Rort's 22nd Panzer Division was now almost encircled in a pocket southwest of Perelazovsky and fighting against the 8th Cavalry Corps. Georgi's division, with just 20 remaining R2 tanks, attacked southwestwards, desperately trying to reach the Tsaritsa River. South of here, the Soviet 8th Motorcycle Regiment had split into five different detachments and had raced off towards Oblivskaya. They weren't able to reach the town, but they did cause chaos in the Axis rear areas. I would like to point out though that there was basically no front line in this entire area, and that there were hardly any Axis or Soviet formations between the 48th Panzer Corps and the Soviet forces at the Liska River. The Soviets really needed to plug this gap in order to form an outer encirclement line, which meant that they needed to destroy Group Laskar and free up their rifle divisions to move south. In other words, Group Laskar was actually having a significant impact, and if the Axis had had any spare divisions at all, they could have attacked into this area and done some serious damage to the Soviet rear areas. Alas, for the Axis, they didn't, which was great news for the Soviets. Of course, Group Laskar was in trouble, as the numerous Soviet units around it squeezed it from all sides. Romanenka sent a radio message calling for the Romanians to surrender, but Laskar and his division commanders were unanimous in their response. We will continue to fight without thought of surrender. The 5th Romanian Division was beginning to disintegrate though, and the pocket was shrinking. So Laskar sent desperate pleas to the Romanian 3rd Army, begging for support. They asked Army Group B if they could allow Group Laskar to withdraw. But Army Group B refused, once again stating Hitler's previous order to hold out. That said, Antonescu apparently intervened and asked Hitler to allow Group Laskar to make a breakout attempt. And this time, Hitler responded saying that he had already given permission earlier, but it had been too late. So something's not right here with the sources, because there's a contradiction. It's obvious that someone's trying to cover something up. My suspicion, purely from speculation, is that Hitler had given permission for Group Laskar to break out, but Laskar simply couldn't have escaped under the circumstances. And then Hitler was made a scapegoat as usual by someone, I wonder who it was. Artillery ammunition was down to 40 rounds per gun. Mortar ammunition was also short. Many men had not eaten for days. The wounded could no longer be adequately tended. And even the recently supplied German 75mm anti-tank guns had proved of limited effect. There was an airstrip at Golovsky, so the Romanian Air Force began to supply Laskar by air, with food, fuel and ammunition being dropped off, and 60 wounded officers being evacuated. But they could only send a grand total of five transport aircraft, and this was too little to make a difference. So that evening, Laskar, Mazarini and Sion met at Golovsky to plan a breakout. However, Mazzarini had had enough. He had been against the 1942 campaign from the start, and now handed over command of his division to Laskar and Sion. The two remaining divisional commanders decided that they would break out at 2200 hours that evening. Sion, in fact, did break out, taking 8,000 of his men and heading southwest. They managed to get through the Soviet 119th Rifle Division's lines, and a Romanian column of 12 kilometers long began advancing towards the 48th Panzer Corps. Sion had got out, but the others hadn't. 
The Soviets routed the 6th Infantry Division and forced the 5th Division back as well. Golovsky fell to the 50th Guards Rifle Division and all communications in the pocket were broken. The Romanians fell back to the north or east and the pocket split into two. General Laskar was captured and wouldn't be heard of again until the end of December 1947. Laskar's deputy, Brigade General Trojan Stanescu, took charge from the northern pocket. And finally, with the line in the west, now along the Krivaya River, Vatutin ordered Romanenko to transfer the 14th Guards Rifle Division to the 1st Guards Army and secure the right flank of the front. And, zooming out again, the situation was now looking dire for the Germans and superb for the Soviets. There were almost no Axis units between the Romanian 1st Armoured Division and the Romanian 8th Cavalry Division, which is a small gap of just 170 kilometers. One thing that needs to be noted, though, is that the Soviets were behind schedule, which gave Paulus time to make a southern front in his pocket. If the Soviets had reached Kalach on the second day, as planned, rather than the fourth, it's doubtful that Paulus would have been able to form a sizeable pocket, and may have even lost 11th Army Corps and the airfields needed to supply his forces. So, heavier than expected German Romanian resistance over the past few days had been significant enough to prevent a collapse of the 6th Army. Of course, this had come at a cost, especially to the 6th Army. Very little fuel and anti-tank munitions remain. Fuel is not sufficient. As a result, tanks and heavy weapons become inoperable. Ammunition is scarce. There is enough food for six days. The chief quartermaster gave the order to burn all the secret documents. The order was transferred to all units and services. And that's why a lot of the information regarding the 6th Army is lost. Paulus then requested freedom of action, and Hitler responded three hours later, saying, Sixth Army must know that I am doing everything to help and to relieve it. I shall issue my orders in good time. To me, this suggests that Hitler hadn't fully ruled out the idea of a breakout, since if their current orders were to stand fast and receive supplies, then what other orders could Hitler give? The only order he could give would be to break out, or at least link up with the relieving forces. So a breakout operation was still on the cards. But I want to point out again that Paulus still doesn't have a breakout force. He's busy bringing units from across the Don, including Huber's Panzer forces, but until that happens, Paulus hasn't got anything in the South with which to break out. Jason DeMarc makes this clear when explaining what forces were in the South at this time. Apart from Panzer Abteilung 129, a composite battalion formed from Panzer Abteilung 103, 160 was nearby, as were several other Panzer splinter groups and a few assault guns and marders. Even if Paulus had perfect foresight and the will to launch a dicey operation, it would have been next to impossible to assemble sufficient forces because Soviet formations were doing an excellent job of tying down German units in other sectors. So, even though Paulus asked for freedom of action, the fact remains that a breakout could not occur at this time. It would have to take place in a few days' time at the earliest, specifically the 25th or 26th, which is what we concluded in the last episode based on Manstein's, von Weix's and Paulus's own assessments and it's clear that they needed an airlift resupply in order to get the fuel and ammunition they needed in order to attempt to break out. So, would they get those supplies? Let's find out. Late on the 22nd of November 1942, Army Group B ordered Karl Hollett of 17th Army Corps to take command of the 62nd and 294th Infantry Divisions and reinforce the Romanian front in the Bokovskaya area. His forces wouldn't fully arrive for a couple of days, but two additional German divisions were on their way. Von Weix also ordered the Romanian 3rd Army to employ whatever it had left, plus some rear service units from the 6th Army, to form a defence along the Chur to the Don. This area would have to be held if the Germans hoped to strike towards the 6th Army from the west, so it became a priority. 
Von Stumpfeld's Arco 108 was one of the first units to deploy in the area and began to take up defensive positions. It was soon reinforced and became known as Group Stumpfeld. Still, with the 6th Army now effectively cut off from the outside world, it needed supplies. And the only way to give it supplies was via the air. So now Goering enters the picture. Or at least we think he did. The problem is that the primary sources are all over the place, so historians haven't been able to reconstruct exactly what happened or when. There are major uncertainties and discrepancies in the sources, so that a precise reconstruction of Hitler's decision-making process during those days is impossible. What is certain, however, is that Hitler had been closely considering the question of supplying Sixth Army from the air while he was still at Berchtesgaden, and that he had arrived at a positive assessment of that opinion. So here's roughly what the sources currently say. Hitler asked Jezenek if an airlift could be done, and Jezenek said he thought so. Hitler then rang Goering to clarify, and he said the Luftwaffe would do all it could to keep the 6th Army supplied. Then Jezenek, who hadn't yet had time to do any calculations, was having doubts. So Hitler summoned Goering from Karrenhall near Berlin to Berchtesgaden on the 22nd to speak to him in person. Goering then said that they would try their best to keep the 6th Army supplied, repeating what he'd already told him on the phone. And this convinced Hitler that the airlift was going to work. Hitler then jumped on his train to travel for 20 hours to East Prussia, while Goering went to Paris to talk with some art dealers. During his train journey, Hitler was in contact with Zeitzler via telephone, and Zeitzler kept asking for the 6th Army to be allowed to break out. But Hitler kept refusing. As this was happening, Jezenek, who was still having doubts, did some math and calculated that the airlift could in fact be done. However, when Hitler arrived in East Prussia, he was confronted by Zeitzler, who argued that Jezenek's calculations were wrong and that the airlift wouldn't work. Hitler therefore summoned Goering again, even though this contradicts one of the sources that says he only saw Hitler on the 22nd and then went to Paris. And, for prestige reasons, Goering was unable to disagree with Jezenek, his chief of staff, and his clearly incorrect numbers. And so just blatantly promised Hitler that the Luftwaffe would supply the 6th Army, knowing full well that it probably couldn't. And then, madman Hitler just accepted Goering's word, dismissed Zeitler's concerns, and it's all madman Hitler's and madman Goering's fault that the 6th Army was doomed. I like the fact that Goering is basically a whack-a-mole. He just randomly pops up every five minutes to tell Hitler that everything's okay. Like, you know, if it took Hitler 20 hours to get from Berchtesgaden to East Prussia, but Goering just teleports there when Hitler summons him. And Hitler also only believes Goering and nobody else for some reason. Also, Jezenek supposedly had doubts and had Richthofen and all the others telling him that it couldn't be done, but then did some quick math and was like, yep, I'm fine with this now. Y you know, it's no wonder that people have just pulled out the Madman Hitler and Goering cards as an easy way to rationalise what was happening. So, obviously, there's a few things wrong with this narrative, and I'm going to offer an alternative account of what happened. But the only thing I'm going to change is the idea that Goering saw Hitler on the 22nd at Berchtesgaden. I think he only turned up in East Prussia. And there are clues that support this conclusion, which I'll touch upon once we've, we've gone through it. So here's my take on what happened. Hitler asked Jezenek if an airlift could be done, and Jezenek said he thought so. Hitler then rang Goering to clarify, and he said the Luftwaffe would do all it could to keep the 6th Army supplied. Hitler then jumped on his train to travel for 20 hours to East Prussia, during this journey, Zeitzler contacted Hitler by telephone, but since the Tunnish calculations hadn't been made yet, Zeitzler had no reason to challenge the airlift idea, and so was actually in favour of it. As this was happening, Jezenek, who was having doubts, did some math, and calculated that the airlift could in fact be done. However, when Hitler arrived in East Prussia, he was confronted by Zeitzler, who argued that Jezenek's calculations were wrong and that the airlift couldn't work. Hitler therefore summoned Goering, once, to East Prussia to speak to him in person. 
Unable to disagree with Yezenek's incorrect calculations, possibly for prestige reasons, Goering said that they would try their best to keep the 6th Army supplied, probably because they all knew it was too late to get the 6th Army out of its pockets, and therefore the airlift had to be attempted. Hitler therefore accepted Goering's promise that the Luftwaffe would try its best, or that it could be done. And Goering flew off to Paris to speak with some art collectors. Obviously, some of the sources contradict this if you take them at face value, but I think this version of events has some merit. Goering only pops up one time. He also isn't travelling from Karen Hall in the north to Burgess Garden in the south to East Prussia in the northeast and then to Paris in the west. He's just going from Karen Hall in the north to East Prussia and then off to Paris, which is far more reasonable. Also, people aren't changing their minds left, right and centre in this version of events. They're also not acting like idiots. And the end conclusion isn't that they're all insane, but that they knew the airlift probably wouldn't work. But even though they knew this, they had to go through with it anyway. So, I think this version of events has some merit, but what's the evidence for this? Well, let's go through it in order. The sources say that Goering probably contracted the Führer by telephone on the 21st, and this is roughly what was discussed. At this stage, Goering, who lacked up-to-the-minute information on 6th Army's encirclement and statistical data with which to make air supply calculations, gave no specific assurances about his force's airlift tonnage capabilities, insisting instead that the 6th Army should stand fast, and that, as Jezenek had said, the Luftwaffe would do all in its power to meet the Army's needs. As soon as he got off the phone, he summoned his quartermaster staff and ordered every available transport plane, including his own courier flight, to be mobilised for the operation. So, at first, Goering wasn't saying that the airlift would work, but that they would do their best to meet the 6th Army's needs. That's an important distinction. Then, after this telephone conversation, Hitler supposedly summoned Goering to speak to him directly. But why would he do this? He's just spoken to Goering on the phone, so why would he need to speak to him in person? Well, the only reason could be is if Hitler had been challenged on the airlift idea. But Zeitzler wasn't at Berchtesgaden, and the earliest he could have challenged Hitler would have been on the 23rd, when he arrived in East Prussia. So the only person who could have challenged Hitler was Jezenek. But why would he do this now? The sources say that nobody, including Jezenek, had had time to do the calculations for the airlift tonnages. The tonnages only appear once Hitler arrives in East Prussia, and Jezenek wasn't there then. So Jezenek hadn't done any calculations yet, and therefore wouldn't have had a reason to express his doubts to the Führer. And let's not forget that the alternative is to say that Jezenek believed the airlift was possible, then had doubts, then told Hitler who dismissed his doubts, then Jezenek did some calculations which proved to him that the airlift could work, after all, and then gave them to Hitler in East Prussia, and after all this, his numbers were shown to be incorrect, so he was having doubts again. In other words, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. It just seems so inconsistent. So, I don't think this is what happened. Therefore, nobody challenged Hitler at Burgess Garden, and thus Hitler would have had no reason to summon Goering to see him then. The most likely time that Jezenek had his doubts and made his calculations was after Hitler hopped on his train. When Hitler arrived in East Prussia, Zeitzler was the one who confronted Hitler over his airlift idea, and he had Jezenek's numbers before him. According to Zeitzler's post-war claims, after explaining at length the tonnages required and the lack of aircraft to carry them, Zeitzler told Hitler, Having examined the facts in detail, the conclusion is inescapable. It is not possible to keep the 6th Army supplied by air. Hitler remained outwardly calm, but with annoyances evident in his voice, stated, The Reichsmarschall has assured me that it is possible. When Zeitzler stood his ground, Hitler sent for the Air Force chief. Now, Goering's and Zeitler's accounts of the subsequent argument contradict each other, and Hayward notes that we can't take either of them as a verbatim account, since both were recalled years later. Obviously, agendas are being pushed, and neither man was willing to admit their own mistakes. 
but by the sounds of it, Goering hadn't seen Yezenek's calculations and didn't know that they were wrong. And both accounts support this idea. According to Goering, when he arrived, he noted that Hitler had Yezenek's calculations before him, and Zeitzler said that Hitler asked Goering if he knew the tonnages involved, to which Goering replied, I don't, but my staff officers do. So it does seem that Goering was caught off guard at this moment. Zeitzler said that the 6th Army needed a minimum of 300 tonnes per day, but since the aircraft couldn't fly every day, they would need to fly in 500 tonnes in the days that they could fly. According to Zeitzler, Goering said that they could do that, and Hitler just took Goering at his word, but I'm doubtful of that ending. More likely, Goering said that the Luftwaffe could deliver the minimum supplies, at which point Hitler was sceptical. Listen here, Goering. If the Luftwaffe cannot carry through, then 6th Army is lost. This is according to Goering's account, and to me, this shows that Madman Hitler didn't just take Goering's word for it. It also suggests that Hitler understood that the breakout could not be attempted at this time, which is why he said the army would be lost. And this is a major indication that Hitler didn't think a breakout was possible. In fact, it suggests that Zeitzler and the others were probably on board with the idea that the 6th Army had to stay put. Goering probably understood this, which is why he therefore assured him that it could be done. Mein Führer, we'll do the job. Yes, according to Goering, he didn't promise that the airlift would work, but that they'd do the job. In other words, attempt the airlift operation and do their best to make it work. And given the context, this makes perfect sense. Obviously, given the nature of the sources, there's no way to confirm if this is what happened, but I honestly can't see Hitler summoning Goering in to see him, knowing full well that Goering hadn't seen the calculations. And when Goering said it could be done, Hitler was all, cool, I believe you 100%, and I'm really glad I got a second opinion from someone who's got no idea what's going on until you were called into the room just now to speak to me. Like, clearly that's not what happened. So, Goering's inputs here may not be as controversial as is often made out to be. He may only have promised that the airlift would be attempted. And his optimism might also be rational. If Goering had been full of doubts, then perhaps he wouldn't have put so much effort into the endeavour, and thus the airlift would fail even more spectacularly than it did. If you're already defeated in your mind, your chances of success are going to be low, because you've already given up on the idea of the task at hand. So, remaining optimistic and motivated to get the job done gives you the best chance of success, and this is a common managerial technique. And, perhaps most intriguingly, while a lot of the sources say that this final confrontation between Hitler, Zeitzler and Goering occurred on the 23rd or 24th, in his book, Austkrieg, Fritz says this meeting likely occurred as late as the 27th. If this is the case, Hitler may not have been properly confronted over the airlift idea until two days after it officially started. And if this is the case, Zeitzler may have actually been complaining that the airlift was already failing, which is why Hitler told Goering that if the Luftwaffe cannot carry this through, then the 6th Army is lost, because it was definitely too late to mount a breakout at that point because the Soviet lines had solidified. That's why Goering said, we'll do the job. So... It may even be the case that the High Command were on Hitler's side until after the airlift had started. This would call into question practically all of their post-war claims. We'll come back to the tonnages in a future episode, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on what we've discussed here. Let me know in the comments below. Overnight, from the 22nd to the 23rd of November 1942, 1st Battalion of 59th Mechanized Brigade reached the area south of the Varishilov prisoner of war camp. It discovered that two companies of German troops were stationed in the camp, along with tanks and artillery. So, at 0400 hours, the Soviet battalion attacked the Germans four times, being beaten back each time. Only when another battalion was committed did the Soviets drive the Germans from the camp. 
Of course, they were counterattacked, but the 60th Mechanized Brigade also turned up to help out, and the Soviets held the camp. Then, Karpovka Station fell to the 59th Mechanized Brigade's 3rd Battalion, only for the 29th Motorized Division to retake it a little later in the morning. Over in the west, the 45th Tank Brigade of Kravchenka's 4th Tank Corps had crossed over the Don River and was preparing to advance east. It's not clear how many tanks this corps had left, but Rodin had less than 40 tanks at this stage, and Butkov had just 24, so it's likely that Kravchenka also had few left. Still, their corps advanced, and there was a fight for Kalach itself, where two Panzer Jaeger anti-tank battalions, the 244th Sturmgeschütz Battalion, and some Luftwaffe and police units resisted strongly against Filipenko's 19th Tank Brigade. Nonetheless, the German defenders saw that they were being outflanked by the 4th and 26th Tank Brigades, and abandoned Kalach before they were overrun, allowing the Soviets to take the town by 1400 hours. The encirclement of the German 6th Army was completed early in the day, when the 26th Tank and 4th Mechanized Corps linked up at the village of Sovietsky. Unfortunately, it wasn't as happy as Soviet propaganda, or some historians later made it out to be. Kravchenka's tanks didn't stop to send a green signal flare, and Volsky's tanks believed the T-34s to be German panzers and started firing at them. Several of Kravchenka's tanks were damaged as a result of this mistake. Nonetheless, once the firing stopped, the soldiers did embrace and kiss each other, at least according to the Soviet sources. Butkov's 1st Tank Corps also advanced into the area around Novomoskovsk, and these actions severed the communications of the 6th Army with the outside world. Colonel Adam was especially concerned that Schur Station had been lost, where 99 Luftwaffe aircraft were seized. So, Adam and two other colonels called Schockel and Goebel now set up a Kanthgrupper to defend the Schur River, which also incorporated Group Mikosh as well. By using officers to collect retreating soldiers that fled in the wake of the Soviet advance, the Kanthgruppen were formed, their companies and battalions led by officer cadets, and bolstered by security, postal, and other rear services personnel, as well as members of Organization TOT. But Adam only had three machine guns for Group Goebel, and there were no mortars, artillery, or anti-tank guns for any of his units. So he requested help, and received some guns from nearby workshops, as well as two 88mm guns. There was even a lack of field kitchens, and troop morale was low, since many of the men had panicked and fled in the face of the Soviet tanks. In other words, this was a ragtag formation that wasn't likely to hold the line if placed under serious attack. To their north, Plieve's divisions advanced east, with the 76th and 252nd Rifle plus the 27th Guards Rifle Divisions taking over the west wing of the Corps and forcing the German units around the 14th Panzer Division to fall back to new defensive positions east of Oskinski. Strecker's 11th Army Corps was also under pressure, and in an interesting move, Powerless placed both 14th Panzer and 11th Army Corps under the command of General Heights of 8th Army Corps. So, Heights was briefly commanding three corps, making this an army within an army. And Heights was given the task of getting the units in the Don Bend over the Don safely, and then form a new western front east of the river. The 24th Army was also attacking the northern flank of Strecker's and Heights' corps, but was unable to break through the German defences, and lost a significant amount of tanks in the process, mostly to mines. Further west, the Soviet cavalry continued to fight with the Romanian 1st Armoured and German 22nd Panzer Divisions, still in encirclement, as elements of these units moved to the Kurtlak and Schur rivers. The fighting was confusing and protracted, and as it went on, Sion's 15th Infantry Division escaped from their pocket through the Soviet lines. Somehow, 3,680 men out of 8,000 made it to the 22nd Panzer Division's positions, abandoning all but two of their artillery pieces in the process. With this reinforcement, 22nd Panzer Division was freed up to move south and fight with the 55th Cavalry Division, which had moved around their flank thanks to the 346th Rifle Division and 8th Guards Tank Brigades. 
At this point, the Romanian armour was cut off from the rest of the German and Romanian forces, and 22nd Panzer Division was in near encirclement too. Georgi destroyed 28 of his own tanks, mainly because they ran out of fuel, and slipped south across the Kurtlak River. Only 11 German panzers and 19 R2 tanks remained in the Romanian 1st Armoured Division at this point. Meanwhile, Group Lascar, now without its leader and split into two pockets, continued to resist, with the situation becoming desperate. In fact, Romanenko ordered elements of the besieging force to move south even before the Romanian pockets were cleared. Apart from Zion's division, most of which had gotten out, the other units were slowly squeezed, with many of their commanders getting captured. General Stanescu was one of the last, and he continued to resist after night fell, at which point he started negotiations to surrender. To their west, the two divisions of Hollitz's 17th Army Corps arrived at the town of Bokovskaya, threatening the Soviet flank. The Soviets responded by repositioning their forces to meet this force, which was a substantial reinforcement that had the potential to cause them significant problems. Back in the east, Shumilov's forces put pressure on the German and Romanian line, forcing them back a few kilometres. The village of Elki held out though, thanks to sufficient German artillery fire against the 204th and 29th Rifle Divisions, and stubborn resistance from the German 523rd Regiment. The 29th Motorized Division also held its front and even counterattacked slightly, with the 13th Tank Corps down to about 120 tanks at this point. To shore up the southern defences, the rest of the 295th Infantry Division, as well as elements of the 14th and 16th Panzer Corps, were pulled out of Stalingrad and other places, and sent to the Karpovka and Marianovka area. Three Kampfgruppe now assembled, subordinated to a higher unit, Kampfgruppe Korfes. And yet another Kampfgruppe formed around the 103rd and 160th Panzer Battalions, and was sent to guard Ilarionovsky, with the rest of the 3rd Motorized Division also preparing to join them, having started to hand over its positions on the northern blocking line to the 60th Motorized Division. The fact that Panzer and motorized elements were being gathered in the south of Stalingrad does suggest that Paulus was considering the option of a breakout, or at least restoring the situation. Meanwhile, Shapkin's 4th Cavalry Corps continued to march south and form the outer encirclement front along the Axe River. Colonel Baumstein's 81st Cavalry Division brushed aside the lone Romanian cavalry regiment that was in the area and captured the town of Axai. While Stavenka's 61st Cavalry Division raced south into the Umant Sevo region, threatening the flank and rear of the Romanian divisions to the east of there. 61st Cavalry Division cooperated with the 302nd and 91st Rifle Divisions and the 76th Fortified Region and converged against the town of Sadovoy, placing immense pressure on the Romanians. Zooming out, we can see the situation at the end of the 23rd of November 1942. The pocket had formed around the 6th Army, and Group Lascar was all but destroyed. Still, the outer encirclement front had not yet been established, and German reinforcements had arrived in the west in the form of 17th Army Corps. Of course, more were on their way, so while the situation was certainly in the Soviets' favour, there existed a massive gap in their lines that the Germans might be able to exploit if they didn't plug it now. This failure to form an outer encirclement ring not only complicated the planning and conduct of future offensives such as Operation Saturn, but also left the door open for the Germans to attempt to rescue their encircled 6th Army from the west. Finally, many have been wondering what was happening in Stalingrad over the past few days, and honestly, not a lot. Chirikov's army continued to mount local attacks and counterattacks throughout this time, but Apart from some minor gains and the removal of some German formations to go west, not much had happened. Churikov does note, though, that later on this day, three enemy aircraft had landed west of Mamiev Kurgan, with another on a nearby airfield. This was the humble beginnings of one of the most infamous airlift operations in history, although 6th Army's diary says the airlift couldn't begin on this day due to poor visibility. So perhaps the planes that Chubikov saw weren't supply planes. 
Some sources also say the airlift didn't start until the 25th of November, which is untrue because 6th Army's diary says that some supplies were delivered on the evening of the 24th. So it's possible that some planes did land with supplies, but the German sources don't mention them. That said, the army was pessimistic with its assessment of the air supply mission, even though it hadn't begun yet, telling Army Group B, The promised supply by air has so far been delayed due to poor visibility. However, even with better weather, it is not possible to achieve the required level of supply. The situation with ammunition and fuel will soon leave the troops disarmed. Why would they assume that the air resupply, which hadn't even started yet, would be insufficient. Had they been persuaded that it wouldn't work by the airmen? It's not clear, but the 6th Army was having doubts about whether it could be supplied or not. My Führer, since the reception of your radio communication on the 22nd, the situation has changed. The establishment of the front of the cauldron, southwest and west, failed. Here, superior enemy forces continue to advance. Ammunition and fuel are coming to an end. Numerous batteries and anti-tank weapons have spent all their shells. Necessary and sufficient supply is not received. The army will be destroyed soon if it is not possible to collect all the forces to block the enemy advancing from the south and the west. This requires the withdrawal of all divisions from Stalingrad and large forces from the northern front. Since a weakened eastern and northern front will not be able to hold, a breakthrough must be made southwest. Although most of the material will be lost, many experienced fighters and some reserves will be saved. I take full responsibility for this difficult situation. The Corps Commanders General Heitz, von Zeidlitz, Strecker, Huber and Jeneke agree with me in assessing the situation. I ask once again, on the basis of the situation, to give me freedom of action. Heil my Führer, Paulus. Finally, Paulus was suggesting that they withdraw from Stalingrad. This is the first time he had stated it bluntly. Up until this moment, he's been asking for freedom of action, but hadn't suggested leaving Stalingrad itself. And this will be an important message because of what was about to happen next. You see, Corps Commander Zeidlitz believed that the breakout was the only option for the army. And to encourage Powers to make that decision, he issued his own order. Order 118, to pull back his 51st Army Corps from the northern blocking line to the Orlovka area. He believed that this would spur the other generals to conduct similar withdrawals, which would force Paulus into action. This order was issued without Paulus's knowledge, so there was insubordination in the ranks just after Paulus asked Hitler for permission to withdraw from the northern blocking line. Bad timing, and another debacle and crisis was about to unfold for the 6th Army, which we'll have to find out about next time. Thanks for watching, bye for now.